Sasso, <laughs> Nanzo, Yadon Tashi Shopan Namso, Du Talo, like a chili ari pass into Supipune, Dusa, Diki, Buddha, and Tasame, Kiko Tote, Gongsa, Kimichi Musuri, to some secure Nanzo, Yadon Tashi Shopan Namso, Pada, who are the Tashi Tingo, Repa, Gashi, and the Tashi, and the Tashi,
My name is Choki, and um, I am a member of the um, Oral History Project group. And um, it is so, so wonderful to see um, all of you here tonight um, to come together to celebrate the launch of um, our book. Um, personally speaking, uh, when I was a freshman in college in 2014, I um, suddenly, randomly got this message from Champala, and she was like, oh hey, there's this you know, thing we're trying to do. Uh, I, I feel like you might be interested. Do you wanna come to our meeting? And um, being at a school where you know, there wasn't a lot of Tibetans to um, hang out with, and then having you know, brought up in a very um, rich and, you know, um, Tibetan community-centric environment since, um, you know, young age, I felt like, you know, this project um, would be a way to um, get back and give back to the community. So I went to my first meeting in April 2014, and I have not looked back since then. And it has been an amazing opportunity for me to um, work together with um, this group and to come together to tell um, really important and um, meaningful stories, um, stories that are often not heard of, that are often erased, um, forgotten, but um, necessary to be told and to be shared. So um, yeah, just a quick intro. Uh, I would first like to welcome um, Gishila and ARTRS member Rinchen Yutso to come onto stage to offer kata to the um, portrait of His Holiness. And while they come up on stage to offer kata, um, our um, team member Chaba Gabon Sangla will come on stage to read the foreword um, provided by Office of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Happy to see you all. I just, before I read this, I just want to say how we felt when we received the letter from His Holiness. It really meant everything to us. Um, I think the project, it's, as Shogura said, I think it's so important to tell everyone's stories. Uh, it's our history. It's crucial that I think we would document all the stories. Um, but for us, I think in the beginning it was very um, meaningful to um, ask um, the Office of Tibet for their, um, uh, for you know, some sort of like a blessing. And when we received the foreword from His Holiness, it made everybody, um, it was just one of the best moments when we received it. So I'd like to read it to you. It's in the book as well. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I am pleased to see that a book detailing the story of some of the Tibetan immigrants to the Boston area in the United States is being published. While some Tibetans settled in the United States in the middle of the 20th century, the United States Congress providing 1,000 visas to Tibetans in 1990 led to the... I'm sorry about this, hold on. I think it's too loud. How does that sound? Is this better? Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna read this um, again, I'm sorry, I don't know if... Uh, I'm pleased to see that a book detailing the story of some of the immigrants to the Boston area in the United States is being published. While some Tibetans settled in the United States in the middle of the 20th century, the United States Congress providing 1,000 visas to Tibetans in 1990 
led to the now comparatively sizable Tibetan population in different parts of the country. Initially, there was apprehension upon some people as to how these Tibetans would fare, particularly in the preservation and promotion of our common culture, language, and tradition. During my many years of travel to different parts of the United States, including to Boston, I have been pleased to see that the Tibetan community organizations have been able to lay a foundation to impart the knowledge of our culture and a way of life to the younger generation while living their lives as good American citizens. I have maintained that all Tibetans living outside Tibet are ambassadors of our community when, wherever they may be. Like Tibetans everywhere, you are also keeping the spirit of Tibet alive. Our brothers and sisters in Tibet remain impressively determined and they are our inspiration. Perhaps over a hundred years ago, some European writers used to refer to Tibetan Buddhism as Lamaism, as if it was not a proper Buddhist tradition. But now, we have been able to convey that Tibetan Buddhist philosophy and culture, a culture of peace and compassion, have the potential to help others in bringing about peace and harmony. The tradition handed down to us from Nalanda, India, includes profound philosophy and logic, as well as a rich understanding of the workings of the mind and emotions. We have kept this alive for more than 1,000 years and now are in a position to draw from it to make a positive contribution to the well-being of humanity. The life stories of the Tibetans contained in this book are but an example of the effort of the experiences of Tibetans who are working to be good citizens of the world. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, June 21st, 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Chambala, for uh, reading the foreword. Uh, next up, I would like to invite um, the TAB President, Lone Wanchula, and TAB General Secretary, Olobayo. Um, so TAB is the Tibetan Association of Boston. As many of you know, it is the uh, community association that was created um, in 1992 to, um, create a, uh, to, to create a community for um, the newly arrived and you know, um, developing community. So, Londela and Olo, please. Hello, good evening and touch to everybody. Uh, I think I've forgotten how to shoot you. I think I've forgotten how to shoot you. I'm going 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 to shoot you. Hello. I'm going to shoot you. I didn't pay any, I need that she and that take three umjanahare, such a the Tango de Tomalia at Bernice, Anne Tensite Don Lata, Kunjo Pasana, Ajila Ponanza, Likashi, Anne Unzo Nani, the Probachi, Anna Proba, Arilia, Anne Shijalia, Ketan Tosan, Samsu Chudan de Dos Chonsha, Lujo Tavarina, Anne Ponanzo Gitati, Akaso, Samsu Shiraya for those, Anne Ponanzo de Unzo Nani, Anne Shilea, Anne Shongi. Ari Shungia, Chosolia, Tavache, Anea, Chapcho Shure, the Cola. Nesu di Tamanzo Perpetuo, Ari Lijoregi, Tambo, Bozo, and the Ed Bernanche, Ponanzo Company, Chungjore, and Tarinde, Perve, Ed Bernacora de Payer, and in Boston, 
Sane Namata, Ali Chang Ali the Canada, Pula Changma Git Sapchin, and it touched and shue. Good evening everybody. I hope you guys all enjoyed your dinner. Uh, my name is uh, Olo Bayul and I am the General Secretary of the Tibetan Association of Boston. And on behalf of TAB, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all you guys for uh, participating in today's event. Uh, I also would like to particularly thank um, the volunteers, the organizers, and all the storytellers who made all of this possible. Um, these are not just stories, these are not just experiences. Uh, I think most importantly for me, uh, in a time where the Chinese government is systematically trying to erase our past, our present, and our future, I see the Tibetan resettlement stories as a form of resistance. Uh, and, on behalf, and on behalf of TAB, once again, I'd like to thank all of you guys for joining us here. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Gondola and Olo. Um, next up, we have a special guest um, who has joined us here this evening. Um, Nancy Tenney is an artist, a designer, and a yoga and meditation teacher who has lived a creative, spiritual, and international life from birth into her United Nations French and American bicultural family. She's a professional graphic designer and an advocate for world peace through fine arts, love of nature, yoga, and Buddhist meditation. Nancy is a climate activist who has been enthusiastically leading creative and spiritual classes for 20 years. A Tibet activist, Nancy was a sponsor of one Tibetan family and a friend of many Tibetans in Boston since 1989 when she began working with Ed Bednar as a volunteer graphic designer and Boston Cluster Site board member for the Tibetan U.S. Resettlement Project during the early 1990s. So please welcome me and join, uh, join me in welcoming Nancy to the stage. Um, so Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Nancy Tenney, and I was an early volunteer with the Tibetan U.S. Resettlement Project, as was said. And I just want to congratulate all of you for the launch of this book, Tibetan Resettlement Stories, Voices of Boston. I'm so glad to see you all and to the fruition of your amazing work. I have great respect for the Tibetans who brought your strength, wisdom, and kindness to America. Thank you for coming. My life has been culturally and spiritually enriched by knowing you. In 1989, I became interested in the Tibetan U.S. Resettlement Project during its formation and volunteered as a designer. I worked with Edward Bednar, who was launching the project in a very enthusiastic way, and it just caught on. I designed the Tibetan U.S. Resettlement logo with Edward, and uh, using the auspicious, endless knot of wisdom and compassion at the suggestion of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. This was to symbolize the link between Tibetan refugees living in India and the Americans welcoming them in the U.S. So a combination of that beautiful link. And uh, it really has come forward as a great symbol for your group. Um, soon after creating the logo, I designed the first brochure for the national project and later a newsletter. I was the secretary of the Boston Cluster Site for a year. And this was really very little compared to what all the groups have done. And we have all worked together to make this fantastic, amazing project 
work and look at what the fruits have been. Many people have come and now many, many um, progeny have come. So um, soon after that, so what I was really excited was the day at Logan Airport when we welcomed June 12, 1992, the first batch of um, Tibetans to come to Boston, 1992. So I very much enjoyed doing this valuable work for 30 years, and uh, 30 years ago, I'm sorry, and the Tibetan cause, and I was impressed with the project. I decided to become a co-sponsor to Tashi Wangmo with Francie Noldi, who is right here. And um, Tashi has been our dear friend since he arrived in 1993, the third batch, and the three of us enjoy spending lots of time together. My family loved having Tashi stay with us when she lived in my home in Concord, Massachusetts. So I would like to invite the sponsors, all the sponsors uh, who are here, to please stand to uh, so we can recognize the work you've done and the friends you've had made with Tibetans. So if you, if you were a sponsor, please stand up. Just to reiterate Nancy's point, um, you know, when the resettlement project began, it truly was a um, team and a um, community effort. Um, not only the sponsors, but you know, all other friends um, who cared for the cause of Tibet and wanted to see something different. And um, you know, also around that time in the U.S., we did have some very you know early Tibetan families living here and the work done by everybody who was involved in this process um, made um, you know this uh, unique moment and um, what we have right now possible so I'd like to thank um, everybody who has you know worked together to uh, create this space and um, this moment for all of us so um, next up we have um, another special guest um, Edward Joseph Bednar has spent most of his life as a community organizer and public policy advocate with a special interest in traditional East-West spiritual communities. From 1980 to 1985, he served as the executive director of the Temple of Understanding, an interfaith, non-governmental agency of the United Nations. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, represented in the U.S. by Desi De Dongla, was a member of this group that Ed was um, directing at that time. Four years later, while working at the Walker Center right here in Newton Highlands, student demonstrations in Tiananmen Square were violently shut down and the Walker Center offered sanctuary for a number of Chinese pro-democracy activists. Only three days later, Desi De Dongla invited Ed to a lecture on the campus of MIT about the situation of Tibet under the oppressive rule of the People's Republic of China. Ed went to the lecture and that was it. After hours of intense conversation with Desi Te Dongla and also local Tibetans right here with us who are present in this room, Ed proposed that we should bring 1,000 Tibetans from the refugee settlements of India and Nepal to the United States of America and that they should resettle in a network of Tibetan cluster site communities, Boston being one of the cluster site cities. For the next 18 months, under both American and Tibetan leadership, advocates lobbied locally and to the halls of Congress to gain 1,000 visas for Tibetans to come to the US. The Chinese government lobby in DC vehemently protested, but with the brilliant help of Representative Barney Frank and Senator Ted Kennedy, 
The visas for 1,000 Tibetans were folded into the sprawling 1990 Immigration Act like a diamond in a stone. Ed then became the first director of the Tibet United States Resettlement Program with headquarters right here in Boston, and the rest is history. It is a tremendous honor for us to welcome Ed Bednar here to celebrate the publication of Tibetan Resettlement Stories, Voices of Boston. His part in the growth of the Boston Tibetan community cannot be overstated. We are inducted, inducted to him for his vision, dedication, and devotion to the well-being of Tibet and its people. Please join me in welcoming Ed Bednar to the stage. advantages of sitting in front is that you don't see all the people that are here until just now I look and I see a full house standing room only a lot of a lot of wonderful people I see uh, Tibetans uh, what I, we, we should consider ourselves indigenous not not really indigenous Americans either we're, we're Tibetan Late, uh, we're American, American latecomers. Uh, people who came were uh, American newcomers in uh, 1982. And uh, I just want to express my thanks and appreciation uh, to Nancy, the, uh, who did the secretary work. She was my partner in the beginning and, and did a lot of work. Uh, together networking with uh, people like, uh, well, G Gordon Schultz here hosted and provided the organizational base at the Walker Center, and, uh, uh, and many other people I see as sponsors that are here today. I really think that uh, we owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to Congressman Barney Frank and to uh, Senator Ted Kennedy for what they did for Tibet. You know, it's not easy to get something through the Congress and then through the Senate. And they were, and also Tenzin Tetong, he said he would try to be here. Is Tenzin Tetong here? No. But uh, uh, Tenzin Tetong uh, is the first person that uh, I met His Holiness through when I was president of Temple of Understanding. His Holiness was on the board, and Tenzin Tetong was his, the North American representative. So we worked very uh, intensively together to uh, get this plane off the ground. And, and it's like a great ship, you know, that... Uh, and we, we, we were building the ship to take a thousand families from Dharamsala to the United States and here to Boston. Uh, but uh, the captain of the ship was definitely His Holiness the Dalai Lama. No question about that. Uh, in 1989, uh, I, you know, I, I, after Tenzin Tetong made a very impassioned uh, presentation on the plight of Tibet, at MIT. Uh, shortly thereafter, in April of 89, there was this terrible massacre at Tiananmen Square. And we all remember how we felt then. Well, well those of us who were uh, Tibet watchers were uh, expecting something like this because uh, uh, the People's Republic of China does not take kindly to minorities, ethnic, ethnic minorities. And, uh, um, and Tibet, of course, is a thousand years older than the People's Republic of China, and that's kind of embarrassing for them to, to know that. And, uh, and so uh, we thought that it would be important because the Tiananmen Square was just the tip of the iceberg. Underneath it, there was a, a long struggle going on of the people of Tibet for self-determination. 
And what I said to Tenson Tatar and what I said to Senator Kennedy and what I said to Congressman Party Frank was that we, we needed to have people here uh, face to face to, to, for, to, to be a voice for the people in Tibet who had no voice, who could not speak out. And, and this is one occasion in which I am very proud to see that Tibet has many voices in this room. And that, and that this is the story of many generations. Like, could, could the people who came in 1992, uh, the first group, please raise their hands? So we, we have, we have uh, many people from the first uh, group of, there's some other hands going up. Some of the people are too shy to put their hands up. There, there's, there's some more hands there. So, you know, the, the, we came, the, the, the newcomers came in stages. Uh, first in 92, and then uh, every six months or so, there would be more and more, until we had, uh, in the beginning, 50 families was, was the beginning of the cluster site, right? Yes. Now, how many, how many Tibetans do we, do we have here in the Boston area now? Does anyone know? Um, Can anyone guess? John, he knows on what? Around 700. 700? Yep. Okay. In 1960, the ones that I knew of was Yeshi <coughs> and Kuncho and Pulsang. They're the only ones I knew in the Boston area. Two. And now we have 700. <laughs> you know, and, and this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Uh, there's the first generation and the second generation. There's, uh, uh, they're now grandfathers. How many Tibetan grandfathers and grandmothers do we have? Quite a few, quite a few. Grand grandparents, look at that. And, and, and what about uh, parents, Tibetan parents with children here? All right, so, so uh, we got the whole nine yards here, as they say in the movies. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the thing that inspired me was the leadership of this community, uh, the monastic community, the monks who had dedicated their lives to a spiritual calling to embody the teaching of the Tibetan Dharma, and uh, particularly His Holiness, but uh, uh, you know, we, we have a great resource in the monastic community of total de dedication to the cause of Tibet. Uh, his Holiness uh, sent me his nephew to be my assistant, Tenzin uh, Takla. And, and uh, I, I, I could see that like lots of Tibetan lay people, ordinary people, were coming into the position of leadership for a new generation. But I also had uh, a, uh, a, Tibet, a Tibetan monk on my staff that worked with the Tibetan Resettlement Project for about five years in Connecticut. And unfortunately, he passed away. And uh, how many people do we know that have passed away in the Resettlement Project in 30 years since we started in 89? Do we have any idea? Not many, because it's, you know, people are healthy here. And, and if, if you had stayed in India, if you had stayed in India, you would be, uh, I, I've, I've tra I, I went to present this project uh, in, in 1989, and I saw the conditions in which Tibetan refugees were living, where you have uh, uh, wood-burning fires, and, and uh, uh, no, very often no no uh, fire fireplace. And so so the smoke is in, inside the house, and and so the, the rate of tuberculosis is very high in the settlements, and of uh, uh, difficulty getting uh, clean water, and uh, although there's always plenty of tea, right? That's that's the basic <laughs> thing. Plenty of tea, uh, and, uh, and and and. So uh, we were very happy to, to see and to welcome uh, the newcomers to this country. And, and I know that, 
that, uh, that there will be uh, many more generations to come of future leadership and continued relationships between India and the Tibetans in exile and the United States. So, uh, welcome aboard. Oh, I have also a copy. We did a, we did a compilation of the press about the Tibetan resettlement project in about 90, 96. There were uh, uh, 16 cluster sites then. Uh, we ended up doing 21 cluster sites around the United States. And uh, uh, I wanted to present uh, the compilation of press clippings to Joppa. Uh, cool saying, is Joppa here? Yeah, Joppa. So there's a story throughout the night for 